Hi, this is the fourth of five videos of my science-based targets lecture. This video gives you an overview of sector-based approaches to target setting. Now this is very cutting edge. It's at the very cutting edge of target setting, but as we'll see, there are issues that suggest this isn't going to be the definitive method. It's going to have to be reworked in some ways. There are currently two sector-based methods, the 3% solution and what's known as SDA. The 3% solution estimates reduction possibilities in many sectors. SDA is the approach favored by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. That's a certifying group for science targets. Um, SDA stands for Sectoral Decarbonization Approach, and it uses long-term sector growth estimates and forecasts about each sector's emissions reduction opportunities to come up with a fair allocation of reductions within a carbon budget. The 3% solution group has a somewhat similar approach. They estimate reasonable reductions for sectors over the next 10 years. Then companies have an annual reduction target to meet. From this slide, you can see how much suggested reductions vary among sectors. These reduction estimates or forecasts are based on research done by the consulting company McKinsey & Company. Notice the 19% to 24%, which is 2 to 3% per year for industrials. That'll be handy when we talk a little bit more about the sectoral decarbonization approach. The 3% solution wasn't really created as a target setting tool, but as a way to show companies that carbon reduction could be done profitably. But it does provide some guidance about the capacity of sectors to reduce emissions. You know, it's worth noting that McKinsey and company have a long history working in this area. It's greenhouse gas abatement cost curve, which was published in, I think, 2009, was a real breakthrough in helping companies see that carbon reduction could be a profit center if it was done properly. I'm going to introduce the sectoral decarbonization approach with an example from Oscar Crabb's article that was um, published in 2015. For the steel industry, <clears throat> they expect a 32% decline in CO2 emissions over the 35 years from 2015 to 2050. That's about 1% a year. Now, that's less than half of the 3% solution recommended recommendation of 2 to 3% per year for companies in the industrial sector. Now, <clears throat> notice that the SDA approach builds in growth estimates in terms of millions of tons of steel produced. So that's the white line just below the blue line in the table. Moreover, if you look at the 2020 emissions, they're actually growing, not declining. So there can be big differences in the assumptions and the results of these two sectoral approaches. The SDA approach has all companies in an industry converging to the same carbon intensity by 2050. So it's a convergence, not a compression approach. You can see the numbers here going from 1.97 um, tons of CO2 per ton of steel produced to 0 0.89. <clears throat> Being a, a convergence approach, it's cost efficient in that all companies have to make uh, similar reductions that presumably have similar costs. Here's the, the convergence of carbon intensities for three hypothetical companies. The high emitter cleans up more and the low emitter doesn't need to do much at all. These are carbon intensities or carbon emissions divided by some measure of production, in this case tons of steel produced. Here are the same three firms with same assumptions, but now we're looking at absolute carbon emissions, so metric ton CO2e. Depending on how much a company has cleaned up, sort of their starting point in terms of carbon int intensity, the SDA method may actually allow a company to increase its emissions. That's like the blue line, the low emitter. Now, 
it seems to me that over 35 years, all companies should be able to clean up some because the entire economy is becoming less carbon intensive. So this result seems counterintuitive to me, and it's one of the issues that I think um, the SDA approach has to address before it can really be universally accepted. We can't let some companies actually increase their emissions over a long period of decarbonization and decoupling of economic activity from carbon emissions. It just doesn't seem right. Here's a table from the sectoral decarbonization paper that shows recommended intensity reduction paths for 11 named industries. For some, the reductions are huge. The first line, now in green, shows power generation going from 591 grams per kilowatt hour to 28.7 grams. That's a 95% decrease by 2050. Now, I suspect this is because renewables will replace a lot of fossil fuel generation, and there'll probably be efficiency gains in terms of um, grid transport and um, some demand side um, efficiencies. Now, let's scroll down and we'll look at air passenger transport. The change is from 176 grams of CO2 per passenger kilometer to 131 grams per passenger kilometer, or about a 26% decrease over 35 years compared to a 95% decrease for power generation. It must be that there are very few ways that air transport can avoid using fossil fuels. So it will, at best, be able to make some only marginal improvements, maybe um, on the apron management. Uh, there'll be some efficiency gains in engine design and so on, but really there's not a lot that uh, airline companies appear to be able to do to reduce their impact. So there you see two sectors, um, very different um, future profiles in terms of their business operations and correspondingly very different estimates of their ability to reduce emissions and, um, and contribute to a low carbon economy. So sector-based approaches, um, they recognize reduction opportunities. They recognize company differences at least the SDA does. And the um, SDA approach converges to a single intensity result. What are the problems? Well, first of all, there's very high data requirements. The focus on intensity um, may allow for absolute emissions to increase. So far, they only work for some industries. Let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of sex sector based uh, approaches. The advantages, the big one is that s sectoral um, dif differences in reduction opportunities are recognized. That's really important, as we saw. You know, the airline industry has very few opportunities, uh, power generation a lot. The SDA approach recognizes company differences because we're starting at different um, intensity levels and then converging to one result. This also makes it relatively cost efficient. Everybody has the same kind of marginal cleanup costs at the end. The problems um, is that sectoral decarbonization has very high data requirements, and it's based on long-term forecasts about growth and technological innovation over the next 20 or 30 years. Now, if these data requirements can be met and trusted, it provides a good way to set targets that are reasonably fair between companies and sectors. Um, there's a focus on intensity that may miss absolute emissions increases. We saw an example of that. And to me, that's just counterintuitive that over 35 years, a company ought to be allowed to maintain its emission levels or actually increase them given the same level of productivity, um, tons of steel or whatever. SDA only works for 
a few industries, about 11 named industries right now. 3% solution has much broader coverage. It's only for 10 years, and it only looks at reduction opportunities, not growth. So basically, there's a huge faith that has to be made in very long-term forecasts. And I want to show you something. Remember that the um, data that was used to do the forecast came from the International Energy Agency. This is something one of my students sent me that I thought was um, absolutely fascinating. It looks at IEA forecasts of adding PV solar each year versus what actually happened. Now, the steep black line is the actual history. And the uh, confusion or snarl of colored lines are IEA's various predictions. The takeaway is that IEA may be excellent at forecasting fossil fuel use and production, but it doesn't appear to be very good at renewables or at um, innovation. Now, innovation and renewables have to be part of the picture. And so if IEA isn't forecasting very well, it really puts into doubt those long-term SDA forecasts, which if they let some companies increase absolute emissions um, creates a real problem for us. So a uh, real brief summary. Um, we're trying to capture differences in reduction mitigation opportunities between sectors. We're trying to figure out a way to allow for growth in some sectors. And these sector-based models are a first step, but so far they're sort of limited and they have some other quirks that may be difficult to overcome. So I'm not sold yet. I think we can use them, but um, with care. And we still need a definitive approach to setting science-based targets. Thanks. And next we go to the last part of the video lecture, and that's John Bird's easy, easy approach to getting a certified science-based target. And then an outline of an idea for a high approach that I've been sort of mulling over over the last uh, several weeks of us I've been putting together this lecture. Thanks so much and um, see you in the next lecture.